It's 11 o'clock in the morning and the little boy is called to the head teacher's office. He's five years old, but he knows the way very well because he's made that journey many times before. Things are pretty chaotic at home and he brings some of that chaos with him into the school. He has one-on-one -on -one, uh, personal supervision in every hour that he is at school. But this time as he sits in the head teacher's office, she speaks very kindly to him. She asks him to sit down. She says she's got some difficult news for him. She says, at the end of today, you're not gonna be able to go home. Well, where am I gonna go? Well, you're gonna go with this lady. She's called a social worker. Where's she gonna take me? Well, she's gonna take you to a, another family. They're called a foster family. Well, how long will I be there? Well, we're not sure, just until it's safe. Well, can I go home and say goodbye to mum and dad? No, I'm sorry, you can't go home and say goodbye to mum and dad, but you will see them soon. How about my sister? Can I go and say goodbye to my sister? No, I'm really sorry. You can't say goodbye to your sister. How about, how about my dog? Can I go pat the dog? No, not today. Well, what about my stuff? Well, your stuff will be brought to you. As so this little boy was put into a car with a social worker, a lovely, friendly social worker, who then drove him to my house. And there he is at the doorstep. And all he's got with him is his lunchbox and his PE kit. And he's angry. He's shaking. Every single muscle of his body seems to be taut and he doesn't know where he is or what he's supposed to be doing. But this little boy is now my responsibility. And so in he comes. Why do I tell you a story about a little boy coming into care? This is supposed to be an event about homelessness. If this had been an event about fostering and adoption, would you have come? Fostering is seen to be something that poor people do who don't have enough money to make ends meet and don't have any qualifications, so that's why people foster. Adoption is seen to be something that people do if they can't have birth children and therefore infertility is the driver and then you really want a baby. But I want to tell you that this issue of children coming into the care system, one child every 20 minutes, is one of the causal drivers of a huge amount of the homeless population we have in the UK. What's gonna to happen to that little boy? Well, according to the movies, maybe you've seen them, whether it's Harry Potter, James Bond, Spider-Man, Batman, looked after children flourish and become world changers. They become our heroes because they're so resilient because of their difficult circumstances that made them stronger and faster and better and more courageous than everybody else. Sadly, the statistical evidence does not support that as an outcome. 38% of care leavers are not in education, employment or training two years after they leave care. 50% of the male prison population in the UK uh, of men who are under 25 are care leavers. In some areas it's 30%, in other areas it's 70% of sex workers are young women that have aged out of care. And what about the homeless population? Well, maybe you know, many of you are professionals in this space. Care leavers make up 1% of the population of the UK, but they make up 25% of people who are currently homeless in the UK. That's out of order, isn't it? The care system is supposed to be something that cares for children, makes them stronger and better. I remember when I was a, a young man, I fell over my shoelace running home from school and I broke my collarbone. And I went to the hospital and they bandaged me up and they said, don't worry, because you've broken it there, it will heal and it will be stronger. Kids who come into care, something terrible has happened to them. 70% of kids in care have experienced neglect, abuse, or sexual violence against them. Something terrible at the beginning of their life. Our care system should make them stronger, more resilient, but sadly it's not working. It's not working because kids aren't finding the permanent loving homes that they need. Why isn't the church involved in this area? Why isn't it top priority for what we do as a church? Because it could affect so many of the other issues that we as a church care about. People are more likely to be sexually exploited if they've been in care. We love doing work in prisons. Homelessness, praise God, has become a really hot topic for the church. But fostering an adoption, well, that's for someone else. And tell me, would you be here if this was an event about fostering an adoption? My vision for you is that we change the way that people think about home and we change the way that people think about justice. Here's how many of us think about home. Have you heard the expression, an Englishman's home is his castle? 
Well, sometimes that attitude spills over in the way that church operates as well, isn't it? We, we do work with those that are disadvantaged and marginalised in a programmatic and episodic way. So we run a project and we invite people to come to it. And we treat these people that come as clients and we're service providers. And then we send them on their way. And then we go home and we lock the door and we have our downtime. Well, what about justice? Justice is a passion of mine. Yes, of course it is. Well, well, I'm really involved on Twitter. I give some of my money to charities, uh, but then I go home and I hang up my jacket. I hang up my uniform of when I'm doing justice and I close the door, I lock it, and now I'm safe and sound. Don't touch my personal space. I need a distance. I, I need there to be boundaries between my life and the life of those people that I'm serving. I don't think that's a Christian understanding of home. I think here's two ways I'd like you to think about home and justice differently. I think, although we say an Englishman's home is his castle, a Christian's home should be a hospital. Where does the word hospitality come from? It comes from welcoming those, not just into our programs, into our diaries, but actually into our very home and into our very life. Our, our home should be a place of safety and security, not just for us, but for those that need it. Well, what about justice? When should you be doing justice? You know, I give 10% of my time to justice. I give Tuesday afternoons to justice. I give 8 a.m. till 3 a at 3 p.m. in the afternoon to justice. I care about justice. Well, when was Jesus doing justice? How many hours a day? How many hours a week was Jesus doing justice? You see, for Jesus, justice wasn't a set of activities. It was an ontology. It was a way of being all the time. When is a foster carer doing justice? Is it an hour a week, three days a month? Well, no. My wife, she's up at 2 a.m. in the morning because the foster baby that's just arrived, prematurely born to a young mum who's not able to care for her, 2 a.m. in the morning, there she is feeding a baby. When's she doing justice? 7.30 in the morning when it's breakfast time and uh, one of the other foster children, well, he's got an interesting relationship with food because of the, the way that he was raised in his birth family and she's trying to help him to know that it's safe to eat from our table. When's she doing justice? 8.30 in the morning when she's taking the foster kids to school and trying to encourage other kids to play. 11 a.m. in the morning when one of our kids has acted out and yeah, it's the interview with the head teacher. When is she doing justice? Justice is a way of being that affects what we do, not just with our time, but actually our homes too. So there he is, this little boy. He's there on my doorstep. He's now in my lounge. We're trying to find words of comfort and help. We know that the odds are against him, that if he ages out of care, like most people do at 18, what are we gonna say? Is he gonna end up homeless? Is he gonna end up in prison? Is he gonna end up neat? Or is there anything that we can invest into him? Even for, if he's with us for a few months or a few weeks or for the rest of his life, is there anything we can deposit into him that will help him know there's another way to live? That's our job. So I challenge you, I was told to be provocative. I love that you're passionate about homelessness and amen. I think it's fantastic and I think the church should be doing more. I love all the projects I've been hearing about. But I'd love us to be as passionate about helping kids right at the beginning of their journeys when they're three, four or five years old and they need a loving, stable home, either through long-term foster care or through adoption. And they get a family support network around them. So that when the bottom falls out of their lives, when they run out of money, there's someone else to look out for them. Many of us here have fragile life circumstances, don't we? Maybe our job is a little bit insecure. Maybe we've got an interesting relationship with a, a certain um, narcotic or drug. But many of us here have family that will stick by us. That if the money runs out or my health runs out, there's a safety net to protect me. That's what these children are missing. And that's what I think we're called to step up and offer. When God describes himself in the Bible, he says, he's a father to the fatherless and a protector of widows and orphans. And God places the lonely in institutions, in programs. God places the lonely in families. I think it's time we stepped up and became the families that these children need. Thanks for listening.